Hi everyone, um, I'm Deborah Cleland. I'm one of the um, co-directors of Thrive and I have here with me um, Dr. Bianca Birdsey, who is the other co-director of Thrive. Um, we have been talking for ages about uh, recording a series of conversations that we feel would be really useful and helpful as resources for new or old parents um, or caregivers or professionals or anybody who has a vested interest in the thriving of the life of a um, deaf or hard of hearing child. So this today, what we are doing is the very first of the recording of those conversations. Um, we decided that it would be great for Bianca and I to start a conversation. Um, the format that we will be having these conversations in is, is a four question format, um, which basically means that whoever we are interviewing or conversing with, we will, we will pose four questions to them. And really that's just to stimulate the conversation around a specific topic. So we, this is the very first of those today. Um, and today we, we are really very simply going to be having a short conversation um, with the topic of the journey of parenting a deaf or hard of hearing child. So me personally, when I say deaf, I'm referring to deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and um, yeah, that's the conversation we'll be having today. So um, I'm interviewing uh, Bianca and um, I'll start with the first question. You ready, Bianca? Oh, awesome, thanks. Awesome. So very simply, my first question to you is just really tell me a little bit about yourself um, and about your, your family. Cool. Thanks, Debs. Um, we started our family thinking that our children were just like any other children. Um, but once they were meant to start talking, we realized that they, they weren't doing so. And um, social media was quite helpful in that, in that way and that we'd see friends with similar age kids post videos about them saying first words and things and that wasn't really happening for us. And honestly, deafness and hearing loss wasn't on my radar at all. We, I'd never really engaged um, meaningfully with anybody that had hearing loss before. Um, it was just simply not something I thought about. And um, we certainly didn't have anybody in our family who had a hearing loss. And after a while, um, we started seeking help and looking for some advice of what we could do further, wondering what was going on. Um, and it was only when our twin daughters were three years old, we found out that they had a severe to profound hearing loss bilaterally. And it was a couple months later that we found out that our younger daughter, who was um, 20 months at the time, had the same kind of hearing loss. Um, and that changed everything <laughs> of our lives. Uh, literally, not much stayed the same. And we started our first step on this journey of knowingly um, parenting a deaf child. And I say knowingly because they'd been deaf all along. We just didn't know it. Um, and, and yeah, and then as people watching might know, a few years later, um, we started Thrive, just simply wanting other parents to know that they're not alone on this journey. Awesome. So that was actually where you leave off. There's the point where you and I actually met, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. And it was just so amazing <laughs> to meet somebody else who, who got it, who got the concerns, who got the joys, who got that bittersweetness that this journey can be, especially initially. Mm. So, yeah, absolutely. You see, I get tears in my eyes when I think about it. Um, I mean, I remember that first time when you and I met um, at Incluf. Um, because we had both through um, sort of a mutual person that we knew um, we put in touch with one another because um, we both had children of similar ages who were um, deaf stroke hard of hearing and I remember that meeting you in that little coffee shop and um, it was just quite incredible to meet someone who for me um, it straight away I was just like had that feeling of you're not alone on this journey um, yeah, and, and just to fill you in a little bit on, on my story, um, so I have three daughters, um, the one sandwiched in the middle is my daughter who is, um, is hard of hearing, she has a, a severe hearing loss, she wears two hearing aids, 
Um, she's predominantly oral, but she's also signed bilingual. Um, and um, yeah, for us, we also didn't, uh, Sarah was born in England. She had a newborn hearing screening, which um, came out positive, meaning that she didn't appear to have any hearing loss. And then at the age of um, around uh, one and a half or two, we started to really realize that something didn't seem quite right. Her speech wasn't developing normally and um, we began to seek help. Um, but it still took us then a long time to actually come to the diagnosis that, that Sara was um, had a severe hearing loss. Um, I always call Sara deaf because um, she, without her hearing aids on, she can't hear anything. Um, but with the hearing aids on, she has she has uh, good access to sound. So our journeys both converged at that point, and you and I have then been on this <laughs> long and winding, sometimes incredibly challenging, sometimes incredibly beautiful. We have been on this journey together. And as Bianca said, Thrive was birthed really at that meeting that we had um, at that coffee shop. And um, we have met so many parents along the way. And I think the reason why Thrive came about was because we just knew, we knew the emotions that we had been through. We knew that feeling of um, that we had when we met one another and how much support that gave us. And that really leads me on nicely to my next question, which is, um, uh, Bianca, what were your initial thoughts and especially feelings when you first discovered that your children were deaf? And then also how has that, um, how have those feelings evolved over Time. I know that's this is a <laughs> long, you know, potentially a, a workshop in that question. But yeah, let's just chat a bit about that. Yeah, I love that question, especially how one acknowledges that things do change and and evolve. Um, so I was completely broken and devastated when I found out that they were deaf, because I'm, I'm quite an efficient planner, and um, that's not necessarily a good thing. I know, and I've been learning. <laughs> But I genuinely had a five-year plan in place that was meticulous. Um, and it all imploded into a bunch of ashes and meant nothing anymore. Um, nothing else seemed important. So there was this huge perspective shift from you know, other dreams and things that I had personally and for our family. And suddenly everything came about um, helping we didn't even know what that meant our our kids um and also just understanding how on earth we got to where we were and what that even meant um so i was deeply sad i was um very disappointed i was extremely angry at my lot that i'd been given in this life like how did i deserve this how did this happen had i done something wrong um i think often questions that that people grapple with, with any form of loss, because at that time it really did feel like one massive loss. Um, loss in everything I had hoped for, loss of just the people I thought I had birthed, like they weren't the same anymore. <laughs> Although I realized they had always been the same, it's just that I didn't know. And, um, and that, how that changed is, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to lie and say that everything's peachy all the time. Sometimes it's really, really hard. And um, and sometimes I just need to take a breather um, to kind of get through the next phase. But what I have learned is that that with any form of, and I mean this really quite specifically, suffering, because it was a type of suffering in the beginning um, with that sense of loss. Any form of suffering, any journey of suffering comes the most incredible treasures um, if one allows it to happen to you. And so I sit now, what, six years later from finding out that they were deaf, um, just with this enormous gratitude for the journey and what it has brought into our lives. So it wasn't initially, it felt like a whole lot was being taken from us, just losses were what was emphasized and highlighted. And whilst there are changes and real losses, my career that I'd worked hard for my whole life was taken in that moment too. So there are not a, uh, losses to acknowledge, but man, the treasures and the gifts that have come have completely enriched our lives and added a very different flavor of purpose 
um, which I think we'll be eternally grateful for. Mm. Yeah, that's what just, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, and I think um, this, we should, we should spend, we should do a, a whole conversation separately about this very topic. Um, my very similar feelings for me, um, probably the two, when I first found out that, um, that Sarah was deaf, was, was um, overwhelm, extreme overwhelm, and exactly what you've said, and I think you and I have heard this from hundreds and hundreds of parents, it's, it's the loss. <coughs> and it's the feeling of being completely alone. Um, those were the those were the those were the sort of really strong emotions, and as you say, it's it, it, you know every day there might be a different emotion, and then as you as you morph on in the timeline, and as your kids get older and you see them developing and growing, um, that also changes. Um, no, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, it was it, you know the thing is there was because you don't know anything, and um, we always say most hearing people who have a child, a child who is deaf, and it's, it's going to be most children um, who are born deaf are born to a hearing parent. And that hearing parent has very often never met another deaf person before. And that was certainly the case for me. So you just have no knowledge, you have no information about what life is like for a deaf person whether they, they can actually achieve anything. You, I didn't know that. Um, I mean, I just remember one of the very first thoughts for me was, will she go to university? I, I don't know why I thought that, because actually I don't particularly care whether any of my children deaf or hearing go to university. But that was just something um, which I think signified um, being able to be normal. Um, and so the choices, you don't know what choices you have. It's overwhelming because then you, when you start to look into it, you've got so many choices, too many choices. Um, and so completely overwhelmed and, you know, absolutely also for me, even though, yes, your child is the same child that they were yesterday, but it seems like in that moment when you find out that they are deaf, it feels like you've lost your child. When actually you have the same child you always had, it's just that you've discovered something new and actually something quite beautiful and unique and special about them. Um, yeah, exactly. Almost feel, oh. what actually has happened is you've lost your picture of what your future should look like with your child. Absolutely. And I think something that humbles me is to realize that that uncertainty, um, that is what feels so overwhelming, is true for everyone. I think if anybody assumes that the particular picture that they have in their minds are of any child is going to be exactly what happens they're living in a dream world so yeah. when that is almost normalized a little bit for me to say well i've just been awoken to the fact that i cannot control everything absolutely um, it, it felt a whole lot more normal and and um, in terms of your comment about going to university <laughs> one of the first comments that i make and i can't help laughing about it because it's insane um <laughs> That was very real, a very real concern is obviously with three kids, once we found out, we weren't sure why the first two were deaf, we thought it could be an infection, could be anything, but when it was evident the third one was, it was obvious it was something genetic, so um, one of my first statements I made to my husband was, are we going to have grandchildren? And in that <laughs> statement was, 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 will anybody want to risk having a deaf child, are my kids going to want to risk that probability in their lives um, because my lens was one that was very dark about deafness it just wasn't mm. something we want and now mm. I've, I mean they all know I've asked them to each have at least four and, and we've all agreed that it would be cool if there were a couple deaf ones in there because we actually know now what to do um, <laughs> so that is a complete 180 in terms of our perspective and my sincere secret thoughts at the time yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I remember thinking, will she ever swim? I mean, <laughs> you look back now and you're like, well, of course she'll swim a lot. But um, yeah, so many, so many mixed emotions. And then for me, I've also, um, well, you and I, we know each other so well. We've, we've experienced together this journey of, um, I mean, for me now, I could, I would not, if I could snap my fingers and have my daughter um, have hearing, I wouldn't do it. Um, 
she is unique. She is who she is. She has brought so much beauty to our family and to the world. Um, and I think a large part of that is, is because of her hearing loss. And, um, uh, you know, it's brought us joy. It's brought um, me into a community that I love and I treasure, yeah, which yeah. we wouldn't have had um, if, if we didn't have a, a deaf child in the family. Um, and there's so much to be celebrated. Um, yeah, absolutely. It just sometimes takes a while to get to the point where you realize that. Um, and I think we'll have to do also another whole um, conversation on the topic of acceptance. Because I think yeah, it's, exactly. it's the, the sort of line in the middle where you move from the overwhelm and the loss into the joy and the possibility and the, the flourishing is, is the point where you, where you reach acceptance, deep acceptance of who your child is um, with, with their hearing loss and the beauty of, of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Bianca, my next question is, um, what has been the most significant learning experience or learning point of learning for you along the way? Just, I know there are millions, but just yeah, if you are, but... focus on one for today. <laughs> I mean, that's an entire book. Um, I think quite basically is that I went from, as you mentioned, being completely overwhelmed with not knowing literally anything about deafness. In my mind, I mean, there was, there was no information to mm. quite honestly being an expert. And I think most parents yeah. that take the journey with both hands, um, develop expertise and there's evidence to suggest to just suggest this is true even beyond um professionals in that space so whilst there will always be new things to learn and i love that actually about this journey but the reality is i know a lot <laughs> probably the thing that's changed the most is the knowledge um yeah. and not just head knowledge but experiential knowledge mm -hmm. um has definitely the one thing has changed the most but also Quite frankly, our lives have changed the most. Um, and I was thinking about, about this concept of journeying. Um, I think one slight misnomer related to the term is this idea that you're going to arrive at a destination. And I think a slight <laughs> difference for, for this journey is that you don't really arrive anywhere. It's about the process. Um, certainly friends with adults, deaf children, still have things they grapple with alongside their child. Um, but certainly, almost in the last few years, one thing that's become more and more evident is that it's not just me journeying, but it's me, it's me and my kid or my three kids journeying alongside each other. And whilst we might be enduring the same climbs together or watching, you know, looking at the same view or having the same rest stop or, you know, just the same long stretch of one foot in front of the other, we're experiencing a little bit differently. And um, that has been so interesting for me. So I might find a season particularly hard and they aren't. So I might find a season, one that doesn't feel like it's keeping me up at night and, and they are having issues that they're needing to deal with. And, and so often things are in parallel. So when I'm needing to tap into courage, um, to advocate for them, they needing to tap into courage to persevere through something that they might find difficult. And that's been really interesting. So it's more just the philosophy of, of how life happens, how, what journeys really mean. It's not about just quickly, you know, finding the quickest way to the end, but rather about deciding to endeavor this expedition alongside your kid. And if anything, the whole purpose of it, the, the end point, the goal, whatever, is not about where we land, but about um, seeing your child be the best version of themselves and, and knowing that they can be celebrated just the way that they are, that you will do whatever you can to make that process as pleasant and as possible um, that can happen. But, but at the end of the day, no one's trying to change them. We're just on this journey together. And I think sometimes when I read um, blogs and stuff about, about journeying like this, there's a lot of guilt that people are left feeling. One is like, oh my word, I've made it all about me, I'm the parent, or it's all about the kid. And, and actually the other day um, I saw a call for stories and they specifically said, we don't want parents' stories because it's not about you. And I thought, actually it is. <laughs> it is about me, <laughs> but it is about them. 
and it is then also about this journey together. And so whilst it is very much about them, it's not only about them, and whilst it's very much about us, it's obviously quite primarily about them. And certainly the relationship between the two is of, of extreme importance to me. Um, so yeah, I'll keep going, one, one foot in front of the yeah. other. Yeah. And embrace learning, embrace learning. I don't think you can learn too much on this journey. Um, mm. I think there's huge wisdom in equipping yourself with information, even about stuff you might never engage with. Mm. Mm. There's something really powerful and, um, and comforting about knowing a lot yeah. about stuff on this journey. What would you say? Yeah, wonderful. Um, so for me, the greatest learning is something I learned from you, actually. Um, and that, because you've, I just, you've said this so often, and it's just the, so, it's so true. And for me, it feels like such an empowering thing. And that is the simple notion that if you make a decision, there is no reason why you cannot decide that that decision is not working for you and change your mind and go down a different path. That for me is, is, is so, it's so hugely empowering. And I think you and I have done that many times. We've gone many here times. and realized that's not working for my child. In theory, I thought it would work for us as a family and for, for my child, but actually I've realized it's not working and that's okay. Mm. My decision yeah, yeah. was not wrong. It was, it's just that we need to change it or tweak it in some way. And then to veer off into a different direction, it is not a mistake. It is all part of learning. I mean, that's a fantastic life lesson in itself, isn't Absolutely. it? Not, not only for a deaf child, but I probably wouldn't have learned that if I didn't have a deaf child because I wasn't having to make decisions that I never expected that I would ever have to make um, in, in this unknown <laughs> realm. So that, yes. that for me, and again, I think we can have, you know, any of these, convers we can have huge conversations around any of these individual things we're talking about today. Yeah. Um, so there's an organization that um, who I love stealing the one sentence from that says as flexible as fluid. And that for me has become something so true on this journey. And again, it's not, Sometimes when one is in a rut, which happens on the journey, if you think of any journey, you're going to be at the bottom of a hill at some point, um, yes. of a journey worthwhile, you know, and um, I really think this journey is worthwhile. And if one commits to something worthwhile, you're committing to challenges. It's just inevitable. Absolutely. I mean, any, anything where people admire the achievement in it all has, has had a significant pain. Um, and I think if Absolutely. you are hoping for that, incredible outcomes moments where which are so we're celebrating you committing to difficulties absolutely and they, they can't really be separated and um absolutely and yeah so when i'm in a in a rut sometimes i think of, oh my word i made that decision wrong and i made that decision wrong and, I, and you can kind of like oh if only i had done this decision then and and actually to just stop and say you know that very first decision that wouldn't be right for my family now was right then in actual fact absolutely fact. absolutely it worked. and it's because it worked then that it allowed me to be in a position a little later to make the next set of decisions but if I you see. aren't flexible you you could it wouldn't be the best fit later. So I definitely absolutely. think being as flexible as good absolutely. is a cardinal absolutely. point of this journey. And, and I think knowing this, um, knowing this actually, it's, you can reach states of paralysis in this journey where you don't know what to do, so you don't do anything. But the knowledge that the decision you make, you can change your mind afterwards if it doesn't work, frees you up to make a decision. Um, absolutely. So, yeah, that's, that's yeah, fantastic. Um, so the last question, um, Bianca, is what one piece, I know that we would again like to give, you know, there's probably many things, but what one gem or piece of advice would you give a caregiver um, or a parent who has recently discovered that the child in their care is deaf or hard of hearing? My one piece of advice would be do your best for today. Mm. If every day you do your best for today, you, there's actually not much more you can do. Um, yeah, I mean, as you say, there is an entire topic of different things we've learned, but, but honestly, I still tell myself that what is the best I can do in today? Yes, whatever choice, whatever that, that I face in two months time is too much for me to figure out and put together now. 
but I actually don't have to do that now. I just need to do what my tasks are today. Absolutely. To see me at the next point tomorrow. And, and my best for today might be staying in bed all day. We have days like that too. And if that totally. means that tomorrow I'm in a better position to sit up and send that email I need to send or make that phone call or text that teacher or whatever, then do it. But do whatever your best is for that day. Oh, I love that. I love, I absolutely love that. I mean, this is, this is it, hey? we don't stop learning. So maybe tomorrow, when it is the best thing for me just to stay in bed for the day, um, you know, when, when I say, I mean, metaphorically stay in bed, meaning that I'm not actually taking any action, but holding back and just gathering myself and keeping myself um, above water in yeah. that day is, is, is what I need to do in that day. And that's my best for the day. That, that might help me tomorrow, no, you know, after having this conversation today. Um, I think that's absolutely wonderful. We're so hard on ourselves as parents and especially as mothers. Um, we are hard on ourselves. Um, I think any caregiver who's, who's sort of protecting and caring for a child, um, we can be so hard on ourselves and, and actually sometimes we need to, um, we need to know that in every moment you do your best in that moment and it all adds up to something. Um, and it's not always this big action, um, you know, and big point of advocacy for your child. It might be something, you know, very small in that moment. Um, I think for me, answering that question, um, what, what one piece of advice it would be that um, no, and, and it might not feel like this right now, even though you're, if, especially if you're a new parent listening to this, but know that um, you are the best expert for your child. There has be, there is no blueprint for a deaf child who is born into the world. Yeah. There's no manual, even though we, you want a manual for any child, we all have had that feeling and we especially would love a manual when we have discovered our child is deaf or hard of hearing. We want a manual because we're overwhelmed and we just want to know what to do. But actually no such thing exists because every child and especially every deaf child is, is beautifully and immensely unique. And, um, and know that the person who is the greatest expert and certainly over time you will become that more and more is you professionals um, who are amazing in our lives and support us through this journey, um, that is their role to support and guide us. But the decision is ultimately yours. I have certainly made decisions along the way that have been sort of discongruent with what a certain professional has advised me to do. But I have had that strong knowing that that this different path is right for my child, especially right now. So, um, and it takes courage. That certainly takes courage um, to go against what a someone who's studied maybe for for you know eight years on a topic for you to stand up and as a parent and say actually for me uh, and for my child and our unique situation because we've all got different situations at home. We've all got different financial, social circumstances, family makeups. Um, we are also yeah. different, so it's not only the child who's different, it's the family that they're born into is different, the dynamics are different, so just know that, that you, you are the greatest experts on your child, yeah. That's good. Well, it's been wonderful chatting, um, I hope that those of you listening have, have found some value in this conversation. Um, and yeah, we will certainly be having more of these. And Bianca, I've just as always enjoyed spending this time with you today. Same with you, Dave. <laughs> Great. Okay. Cheers, everyone. Till next time. <laughs> yes. Till next time.